We started the year, entire January, and continuing in the book of Nehemiah. And the whole idea, I'm not going to recap everything, but the whole idea is, the book of Nehemiah is about building, building a wall and building God's people. That's what the entire book is about. First half is a, a man called Nehemiah having a burden from God to restore the walls around the city of Jerusalem. And man, we, we spoke enough about the importance of that back in those days. That was their safety. That affected their identity and really their pride as a people. But when your walls were broken down, you were a disgrace because your enemies had easy access to you. And so Nehemiah is a book about rebuilding. And we said we, we're paralleling it to our lives where we are whatever God is calling us to. We want to build God's, God's plan and his call in our lives for 2024. We're building what God wants. And so Nehemiah... He was not a priest or anything. He was actually a political leader. He was from another nation serving a foreign king. And he was called. He had a burden for his homeland. And so what he did was he petitioned the king to give him permission to go ahead and restore the walls. And so he got favor. He got a miracle of provision from that foreign king. And he's a... He goes into Jerusalem, not as a king, not as a leader really, but more as a politician really. Someone of some level of influence coming from the king's palace. But what is beautiful is God used him where he was at. And God gave the people that were in Jerusalem a heart to receive him as well. And so we've been through the past several weeks of his arrival in Jerusalem, the favor of the people to follow and to be committed to the vision that God had placed on them, on Nehemiah, to follow him, to be united. We see that from the first time Nehemiah enters, that they're enemies to God's plan. And I don't know about you, but how many of you, soon as you feel like you're doing what God wants, it always seems like everything goes wrong. I ain't talking to you all who doing wrong and things going wrong. I don't like to quick to be doing that now. But sometimes what's going wrong in your life is because you're not obedient to God. And the enemy has free reign on you. Or maybe you just saw the wrong things, you're reaping it. You saw the wrong decisions. <laughs> Too early, Jay. What is wrong with you? We need to start any word, you know. Yeah, boy, I don't know what's going on here. Listen. But the truth is, no matter what you do for God, when you start to walk in God's obedience, Man, you're going to face opposition. And we saw that from chapter 1 straight to where we are today. We're going to jump into chapter 6. Where basically, they are about to finish the walls. So they've had opposition from the moment they stepped in. All throughout, we saw it. We saw, we saw opposition from outside. And we saw opposition even with God's people. And so, where we, begin, where we are starting off today, we're going to cover chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6. You can follow along in your worship guide. Verses 1 to 4. Now when it was reported to Sambala, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and to the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, and that no breach was left in it, although at the time I had not installed the doors in the gates, Sambala and Geshem sent a message to me saying, Come, let's meet together at Sepharim in the plain of Ono. But they plotted to harm me. Verse 3, so I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I am unable to come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Then they sent messages to me four times worded in this way. And I answered them with the same wording. Look to the person next to you, tell them don't come down. Come on, tell them, tell them like you have some conviction. Don't come down. I right, don't buff them though, man. Come on. Just because you know they're coming down. Don't I? Truth and grace, y'all. 
Here's the first thing I want you to, to recognize, and if you join us for the first time or you know, the first time in a while, the context of this is all those people, Sambala, Tobiah, and, and Gisham, you got to understand who these men are. They're powerful men. In chapter 4 or 5, I believe, we actually read about them talking about the walls, mocking Nehemiah in front of their brothers, as well as the Bible actually says, in front of the wealthy people of Samaria. In other words, they had influence that they could gather the powerful people. So some of them were political leaders, influential governors. And he's thinking, well, I what do I have to do with anything? Real simple. When people of influence and power approach us, we, we most times respond differently. Even within the church, we chase after influence more than conviction. We want to sit at, at the tables of certain people because of what they what they carry, or what they've achieved, or who's, who follows them. They themselves being influential, here's the first thing I want you to think about when it comes to the schemes of the enemy in your life. Beware of the scheme of enticement. The scheme of enticement. Let me just... Expound on this a bit. For the past several weeks, we saw where these powerful men tried to stop the wall by ridicule, by, by actually trying to harm Nehemiah and the workers. They tried all different means of direct opposition. But now they have come in a different tone. Hey, come, let's chat. I'm inviting you to a space where the people who came together are influential people, are powerful people. So the questions I want you to wrestle with, because some of us will sit down here and we may be tempted to think, I know that, I, I know that shallow, Jay. Come on, let's be real. None of us want to believe that we will be so simple that we would run after people like I just described. So, I want you to, you can take note of this, but I want you to wrestle with this this week. When it comes to enticement, who appeals to you? I want you to do some, some reflection. Who appeals to you? Is it the powerful? Is it the rich? Is it the people who have a lot of material success? And how you know this? Who, when they give you recognition, you feel validated? Because more than likely, those are the type of people that can entice us. So, who appeals to you? Some of you had the flip side to that. You're not running after the powerful people because you have your own ego. So the people that appeal to you are the people that depend on you. So you're always chasing circles and communities where people like to look up to you. Who appeals to you. And if that hits in you somehow, then we got to check. As disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, it should be the godly that appeal to us. It should be the humble that appeal to us. It should be those who walk in holiness and righteousness. But we got our eyes fixed and impressed on people in the standards of the world rather than the standards of Scripture. I like my baby. He, he gave me some, they gave me some feedback there. Let me just say this though. Eh? A, lot of, a lot of people is feel how kids make noise, expect them to make noise. They're welcome in this space. Just letting you all know straight out. I said that for my brother. Can you watch me there when the baby make noise? Now? And I just have to... You see, most always be stay quiet when I preaching so good. 
I stake all that. <laughs> but don't, don't miss it. Are we really honestly intrigued and impressed with the fruit of the Spirit? People who are good at long suffering. People who are truly kind. Most times we aren't. Most times we put those people in the four walls of the church and then we live everything else outside. Who appeals to you? The second question I want you to wrestle with when it comes to enticement, where appeals to you? So this one, where? And I was, I was struggling between, I'm struggling. I was going to say, well, you know, we should say what appeals to you. But I think where is more relevant in our culture. And let me, let me explain why. Where doesn't simply mean a physical location. But I do mean physical location as well. Eh? And I'll explain that just now. But it means where. Where on the social status appeals to you. Where you, where you keep driving yourself. Overworking yourself to reach. Where on the social status appeals to you? Well, Jay, you know, I humble. I, you're humble, but your actions speak differently. Because you're chasing everything that you want to run after. To make you feel like you are somebody. You'll be posting some real foolishness out here, you know. I feel like always make me want to fast from social media sometimes, you know. 365 guild, not 21. Okay, it has so much a human so-called wisdom when it's really just lost for the things in this world. Hey, do it. 2024, do you. Like deny you. Pick up your cross. Like speak right theology, right? Or, anyway. Where appeals to you? Where on the social status you chasing after? But let's let get, let get to the physical, right? Because this is how you know what's enticed people. And I, I, I brought up the social media for a specific reason. You all know how we like to post when we in them fancy restaurants? Because it entices us. Oh, come on. You're silent on your social media. You are none to talk about Jesus. But we see in your food and we see in the name of the restaurant. Well, Jay, don't hit me that I don't post often. That's exactly why what you post reveals more of your heart. Because the only thing that it drives you and entice you is where you're going. Let, let, me, let me talk for the people who are not in the room then, right? So, hey, you know your unsafe friends you have on social media? What are they doing? Not posting what fed they on? Because our fed is a rank. What appeals to you? Because certain fat, not all fats are equal. Ole, <laughs> Ole, like the front in this house, you know. Ole, I just wonder if I'm talking to myself. Ole, front in here. Ole, trying to look holier than thou. Not every fat, fat created equal. So Ole, no. When they in the little balance in the little bar, they ain't posting that. But let them pay and they're not all inclusive or something. What? And some of you all it was there too. But we, we, no perfect people. You're welcome here. You're welcome here. <laughs> Where appeals to you? See that? We want to have these conversations. Because enticement is a bigger issue within the church than we want to admit. And I might not have hit your thing, but the Holy Spirit hit in you. Whatever it is in your space. So let me say it this way, right? The things that the enemy is trying to entice you with, the main purpose is to pull you away from the call of God. That's what Nehemiah was fighting. It wasn't to say that we look holy, like some of us trying to prove. No. Because some of you all, we live 
in a way that people can't see the wrong, but we're not actually doing what God called us to do. We're in the same boat. We're in the same boat. You see, we've treated Christianity as the absence of things that people could condemn us from. It's not just what you don't do, but it's are you obedient to what God has called you to? And so Nehemiah is on the wall again, ready to finish it. And the enemy scheme is to entice him to do what? Come down. I say, I'm doing a good work. I'm not coming down. Some of you, you're coming down from what God has called you to. When you're supposed to be reinforcing where you are. If God planted you, stay where you are. If he brought you to it, if he has spoken, be firm. And say, I'm not coming down. This is, whatever is the area in your life that you seek praise, recognition, or validation, it's probably a good indication of what entices you. But this is what got me. Satan knows what is broken in us. And he entices us to such. I know I get a bad rap with this, right? But when I was preparing that statement, Satan knows what is broken in us. When I talk to the singles especially, I am not trying to be hard on you. I am saying that whatever is broken in you, get healing first. Get healing first. And it don't matter if you're, you're not single. If you're in a relationship, even. Because whatever is enticing you, because I'm saying this, hear my heart. Some of you ignoring the brokenness and ignoring the steps to get healed, and you think that relationship is the answer. Wherever is broken in your life, Satan knows it better than you and I. Come on. Get healing first. But you got to know that it's a scheme of the enemy that he is always looking to entice God's people to come down from what God has called them to do. Amen? So why is enticement so effective? And I'll say this to you. The thing that Nehemiah stood strong with is he was committed to his call. That's why you need to be planted. I wouldn't hit that one hard, but it's why we resist community. And let me say why, yeah? We resist godly community because we want to run and we want to resist our brokenness. Most people in this space, and those online as well, we can all recognize or even identify things that are not right with us, you know. But we didn't want to talk about it with anybody. Here's why. It's easy just to accept it. But we don't want the accountability to own it. And be held accountable to make the right choices around it. I know we live in a world where. So we don't want it because. And I'll say it to you this way. The presence of God. And within the presence of God's people. Is where we are truly revealed. You all don't mind the first part of that statement. You don't mind being in a church service. And God revealing something in you. And it's you and God alone. But in James he says confess one to another. That you may be healed. This, this culture and this society. When it comes to our brokenness. Why we are so enticed by the world is because we're not dealing with the brokenness in our lives. And the reason we resist God's presence, whether through Him one-on-one -on -one or... That's why. That's why some of you resist church when you're going through those seasons. Because you know what is right, but you're choosing wrong. You make all kinds of excuses. It's alright. I ain't going to say what kind of church or listen I like right now. Learn my lesson this time. But this culture tells us, here's what. 
Know yourself, right? Everybody on our journey to know yourself. And we do have all kind of fancy psychological counseling, all sorts of things. But the real place that you discover yourself is in God's presence. And I'll back it up. A great prophet in the Bible was Isaiah. Called, anointed, and speaking the word against God's people for what was right and what was wrong. But the moment he got into God's presence, there was a new revelation. He said, woe is me. You want to know who you are? Get in God's presence. No counselor, no pastor, no preacher, nobody could actually dismantle all the layers as God can. One moment in his presence will break all your, all your camouflage. Will uncover you. That's why Isaiah said, woe is me. That's why we resist the church, that's why we resist God's people. Now, my, be- my friends better off in the world. Them, them is treat me better, blah, blah, blah. You ain't want to hear the truth. Because when you are wrong God's people, that is where God does his work to bring healing. That accountability is built in deep, authentic relationships in the church. And, and you know this word accountability, we keep talking about it like it's something to add on. But the truth is, when you are in deep relationship with the persons that are closest to you, you automatically give that. So let me say it this way. If you don't have it in your church community, it's because you haven't built authentic relationships yet. Stop fronting. Stop pretending. I'm talking to the Hope City family now. Stop faking it. Because accountability is the fruit of genuine, deep, authentic relationships. We don't want the right for people to hold us accountable. That's why we know to do church really well. To keep it at arm's length. But when we don't, here's what happens. We get enticed by the shallow praises. We want people to give us the the compliments and all those things. But I love this minister, Alan Redpath. He says, whether you be a pastor or teacher or evangelist or Sunday school leader or whatever position, maybe in Christian leadership. And I want to just say this. Every single one of you as a follower of Christ, you are called to some level of leadership. I ain't talking about our org chart here. You're called to lead in your family. You're called to help lead with your spouse, to lead your children. Every Christian is part of Christian leadership. For the very least, you're called to lead yourself well. And some of us struggling with that. Let me say that there will... Always be those who are friendly to your face, but plan your downfall behind your back. Beware of the fawning, flattering Christian who is always fluttering around you and who behind your back will be the first to rejoice when you go down. Don't come down. Don't come down. But to stay committed to God's plan and His purpose, you can't do it alone. That's why you've got to do the hard work to build the tough relationships. That was just point one, you all. <laughs> Don't get on like we did already. <laughs> Don't, get, Don't get on like that. Don't get on like that. Come on. Man up, right? That. <laughs> Nehemiah verse 5. Verse 5. Then Sambalat sent his servant to me in the same way a fifth time with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations. And Gashmu says that you and the Jews intend to rebel. For that reason, you are rebuilding the wall. And you are to be their king. According to these reports, 
you have also appointed prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem concerning you. A king is in Judah. And now it will be reported to the king according to these reports. So come now, let's consult together. Beware of the scheme of defamation through fear and intimidation. If it's one thing the enemy is trying to destroy is the reputation of, of the believer. Who you are in Christ is always under attack. Who you are, and I'm not talking about what you've done, you know. I'm talking about who you are in Christ. Your integrity, your character is always going to come under attack. Why? Because that's your testimony. What this attack was, listen to what the enemy was doing. He sent an open letter. We'll get to the open letter just now, right? But he sent a letter to Nehemiah saying, it is reported among the nations. In other words, in our modern day, you know when somebody approach you and say, well, you know, they say, you know, I heard, they, they saying this about you. Or they, who is they? Your one gossiping friend. But you always have support. As a pastor, I've learned long time now. I don't listen to critique unless you want to identify who it is. Matthew 18 tells me how we deal with Christian conflict. It is not anonymous. And you're confronted with the gossiping on down low. Well, you know, pastor, they, they feel this way. Who's they? Well, you know, they entrusted me. I say, well, okay, have a good day. i real simple with it. I know you all might like that. Woo, that's okay. But I understand that gossip is a cancer that will destroy the best of churches. And I ain't about to deal with that. This is our standard. We read and we do discipline according to scripture. And it says if your brother, if you have out against your brother, go to him. Don't go to your brother, sister, brother, brother or something. Go to them. And if you can't do that, go with the witness of another brother. And then you go with the elders. And then if you can't do it, you go, then it goes to the congregation. Yo, we, the word is timeless, eh? Dying for that, just that, that, that time. That's how we should deal with it. That's why things like this, this, this strategy of destroying someone's character and their reputation is so effective even within the church. Because we want to speak about someone, but we don't have the respect to say it to them. Now apply that to any area and any relationship in your life. We have to make sure we are the tool of the enemy. That's all right. Character, the reputation. But here's, and here's why I'm saying it is tied to gossip. Sambalat sent his servant. The fifth time, they, they're trying to get Nehemiah to come to them. Now, they, they stopped doing the, not, the normal appeal. So, they basically said, here's what. There's the report they're saying about you. That you, you building back the wall to rebel against the king. The very king that you were serving that gave you permission. Come on. They basically go and say, the king going and come against you. And wait, wait thing going to happen if you are king leading and ruling our territory and somebody trying to promote themselves as another king. You're going to wipe them out. So what are they trying to do now? Fear and intimidation. They're trying to instill fear to him to make him come to us. Here's why the open letter. In those days, most of you probably know this, but when something was an official decree, it will always be stamped and sealed. Any politician, any king, any leader, Whatever they're saying, they would 
They would validate it by putting their stamp and their seal on it. So that that letter could not be opened until it reached the person it was supposed to deliver to. But an open letter meant that every hand it passed through, read it. So by the time it reaches Nehemiah, guess what? Everybody already talking. Why? Because it's the pressure for him to make a decision feeling that the world against him. Come on. Some of us doing that. Some of us doing that in the church. We don't like what somebody, a brother did or a sister did. And we're telling everybody else instead of going to them. Come on. But the enemy is doing that to your life. But here's the thing that is, is common in the two attacks. It's sin still faith. The open letter was the, their ancient way of gossiping. Come on. That's, that's why he did it that way. Spurgeon says this. I didn't put it in your note. He says, a lie will go around the world while truth is pulling its boots on. It's easy for the enemy to come against your character. Easier, much easier and much quicker to, get, to gain support with many people. Because our human nature is we like bad news about other people. Don't front with that. If it's our bad news now, we will pray. If it's somebody else's bad news, we want that air. Hey, hey, bars, boy, bars. That wasn't in my notes there, y'all. Here's how you know how to stand. And I got I to gotta say this really direct. 1 Peter 3.16 says, Having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evil doers, because Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. Those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. You know something, the church really will be self-deceived a lot of times. Sometimes what people say saying about us is because our character is really bad. Or because of something we did wrong. How you know when is the difference? When they are coming against the good conduct in Christ. What they came against in Nehemiah was the very thing God had called him to. Not the thing that you chasing after and asking God to bless. No, we ain't fighting you down. We correcting you. Don't take that point and think because somebody is actually calling out the part in your life that does not align to God that they try and attack you. Align where your life is. Are you walking after the call? Are you planted? Are you still on the wall for what God called you to do? Church attendance is not planted. Come later, you'll hear more about that. We ain't building our church for Sunday morning. I'm playing people don't like that. The church should do this. We should flow this way. We should calm down. We're here to, we're here to build and create disciples, not churchgoers. And that's something you will test based on if you are being attacked, based on your good conduct. In Christ Jesus. That's what you have to measure against. Not your own opinion. Not your desires. Not what you want to do. Come on. Are you with me? But I love Nehemiah's response. Verse 8 and 9. Then I sent a message to him saying. Nothing like these things that you are saying has been done. But you are inventing them in your own mind. You all think I have bad? Well, Nehemiah, that song's very prideful or arrogant. No, the man was dealing with the falsehood. He dealt with the lies. That's why I'm telling you, when people come to critique, come with truth. 
But look at Nehemiah's response. For, and he, he knew, he discerned. For all of them were trying to frighten us, thinking they will become discouraged with the work and it will not be done. Remember we spoke about that a few weeks ago. The discouragement. How do we deal with our discouragement? They were consistent and persistent to come after Nehemiah this way. The enemy has more drive than most Christians. If it's one thing you want to take notice of, is how consistent the enemy was in attacking to try to stop the work of God. And how persistent he was. Some of us, we can't stay consistent seeking God the way we said we would. And the moment things don't go right, any kind of deviation from the norm, you drop the things of God. No perseverance. No perseverance. You could learn from the enemy here. From the early chapters, they've been trying to, to discourage them. The, listen to it now. The walls finish, you know, and they're still trying to discourage them. What if the church had that level of commitment for the things of God? Let me just put that in. Here's what Nehemiah proved and showed us in his response no fear of man or their opinions. You can't stand that way. With no fear of man, when you had that brokenness in you. When you're looking for that acceptance and that validation from someone, you will always be ensnared by their opinions. That's why fear of man, Proverbs said, is a snare to you. But here's what I want you to get. A little principle that the church, I think, needs to learn from. Write this down if you're taking notes. Diligence over deliverance. Diligence over deliverance. And let me just explain that to you. Stop praying for God to deliver you. Because if you are where God wants you to be, then pray to be strengthened. The diligence of Nehemiah was not that he went to God for the help first. Was he addressed the lies of his enemies. The church has a poor and honestly, almost like a lazy mindset. That we need God to do everything for us. If God called you in it and you are and the enemy is coming against you, it means He's called you to stand firm. Nehemiah didn't go to God first, you know, to pray. He responded to the lies first. And then he asked God, strengthen us in this. Strengthen my hands. Look at the end of that verse in verse 9. But now God strengthen my hands. The prayer was the shortest part of his response. Faith without works. How are you saying? Well, you know, Christ stayed silent. Let me get a news flash. You and I in Jesus. And let me take it further. The New Testament call is for you to be salt and light. And a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Ooh, this kind of false humility is a disguise for submitting to the enemy. So if God called, and you saw what I said, stop praying for God to deliver you if you are where God wants you to be. Pray to do what? Be strengthened. The whole point is what? I'm not coming down. Even though, look, one attack, second attack. I am not coming down. But the second one did shake him. Because he went to God to say what? Strengthen my hands. Strengthen me. But not after he responded to their lies. Don't come down. I found Charles Spurgeon said this and I, I feel like this could bring freedom 
for some of us. If any man thinks ill of you, do not be angry with him. For you are worse than he thinks you to be. See, I'm not going to give you any kind of false motivation. Like, don't worry what your haters are saying. You're better than that. No. If they say something that a little correct, you know yourself and God knows you. We worse than we appear to be. If you can live in that truth, then you will be able to glorify the work that God has done in you. And then you will start to rely on His strength, His grace, His validation and who He says you are. Because He has seen the worst in you and still call you son and daughter. That's the real strength. I ain't here to motivate you with no fleshly thing. That, you know them rubbish we be posting out here. If they accuse you of something, let them know. You're right, but you ain't even know half of it. I forget, we have a holy church here. <laughs> Only the pastor know what that means. Hmm. If you all really understood that, when they come to destroy your character, because here's why. The person that's close to God, we ain't trying to produce something fake. That's why we say it every single week. No perfect people. Because we want you to be reminded. We're reminding ourselves. It's only by God's grace. So you're right. You'll see some things that are wrong. You'll see some things that we don't always get right. But also, don't be so quick to watch your neighbor that you forget yourself. Come on. Wherever the enemy is coming against you, to entice you, make sure those places are broken, you're praying it before God. Be real, be honest, submit it to God, confess it to someone. And when he's attacking your character, you need to look and examine to see if it's true, but you could accept God's grace. But even when it's false, you address the lies and you stay up on the wall or the thing that God has called you. Do not come down. That's what Nehemiah is doing. No matter how bad the battle got, he wasn't coming down. Amen? Amen. And the final one, verse 10 to 14. When I entered the house of Shemaiah, the son of, I just call this the liar, right? Because I felt like these characters, they were just lying. Son of Mehetabel, who was confined at home, he said, Let's meet together in the house of God, within the temple. Let's close the door of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. And they are coming to kill you at night. But I said, should a man like me flee? And who is there like me who would go into the temple to save his own life? I will not go in. Listen to verse 12. Then I realized, again, discernment. I realized that God certainly had not sent him. But he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Nehemiah built this wall yesterday. I feel like we are prophets who stake for hire. So I see it and you get a word. Seems like the same thing. He was hired, verse 13, he was hired for this reason. Just imagine, they're talking about a prophet. They're talking about a man who's speaking for the temple. Who representing God. He was hired for this reason. But here's what the reason, that I would become frightened and act accordingly. To do what? Act in fear and sin. So that they might have an evil report in order that they could taunt me. He goes again. Nehemiah goes back to God now. Remember my God. Tobiah and Sambalat. In accordance with these works of theirs. And also Nodiah. The prophetess and the rest of the prophets. Who were trying to frighten me. So just take this note. And we'll just. Get ready to, to wrap it up. Beware of the scheme of deception. 
Beware of the scheme of deception. I know we just, I know we going through this quickly to get through to the get through the chapter, but do not take for granted or miss what we just read there. We basically read that the enemies of God paid the people who are supposed to represent God to give a false word. Not everyone that comes in the name of God is from him. And let, let's break down why we know this to be true. Nehemiah said, hey, they wanted to frighten me and act in that fear to sin. Why? The advice, the quote-unquote prophet, his prophecy to Nehemiah is, hey, they're coming to kill you. Run to the house of God and get saved. But Nehemiah knew better. Nehemiah knew that only the priests were allowed into the holy place. Come on, don't miss that. Which meant Nehemiah knew the laws of God. He knew the laws of God. He could tell the difference between a person who had the position of being appointed by God to what God actually said. Okay, let me say this. God will never contradict his word. I, I will leave that one for now. Nehemiah knew only the priests were allowed into the holy place. So that was one way he knew it was a deception. But he also knew if he fled now, what message that would send to the people. Ultimately, what they were asking him to do was to leave what God had called him to do. And what they used again. They didn't say they're coming against the whole set of people, you know, because the wall was finished. Imagine they reach the end of this, this project, you know, and they're still coming against what they try to do. They try to threaten the leader to make him compromise, to make him sin. He knew if he fled, he would lose the respect. He would lose the authentic call of God on his life to disobey God in front of the people. So a couple things with deception. You've got to always question the source. So the wrong source, even though it's looking like a person of God. Some of you listen to too many voices. Listen and chasing after too many preachers. If God plant you, You all have more word and more anointing from somebody else you can't even connect with. Who can't even hold you accountable. But my, my Bible tells me that in, from the words of the gospel, that many false teachers have gone out into the world. Every book in the New Testament, except for one, hear this, sir, warns about false teachers. And yet the church culture is, we, we go into every single person to hear. But you ain't faithful to where you're planted. Cultural Christianity. Cultural. You don't even know these, these preachers like, but you're taking their word. All right, Jay, hit them. Let me go, let me go, let me go. Wrong sources. Because we could celebrate anybody we far from. Because we can't test it. And they can't test us. It's alright. That is alright. Or they could watch. You could get vexed wherever. The people who stood there. Was false teachers. They took a bribe. They compromised for money. And plenty out there. That's exactly what they're doing. They're preaching a cotton candy gospel to get more followers, influence, and you helping them. That's all right. I, 
I tell all you, we're not here for the numbers. The numbers we celebrate is the salvations. Fire for anything else. We'll stay faithful to the word and the word only. I don't care about your opinion and how you want to negotiate. Well, you know, in this cult. No, the word remains the same. Every line on line, precept by precept. Don't come with your, your cultural Christianity. That's why you can't stand up against the enemy. That's why the enemy running, ravaging your life. And you want to blame everything else. But you don't want to look in the mirror. Because you're listening to every source out there. And you want to honor where God has you. Oh, he lead you here, but you're halfway in and halfway out. My Bible tells me and warns me. I told our team this morning. I said, just imagine, everybody want to talk about the end times. Who's the end? All this kind of thing. And all the signs that Christ spoke about. Every one of the signs he mentioned once. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, natural disasters. And we go on a... You hear every end time ministry talking about all these signs like that. But the one thing Christ mentioned twice is false teachers. And we didn't want to address that in the church. But not here. Not here. We'll stand on the word and we'll deal with it as it comes. And I don't care how good they are. I don't care what their reputation. I don't care how much followers they have. If they're preaching false... We call them as they are. Wolf in sheep clothing. Some of you, you're deceived because you have so many sources and you're not faithful to where God has you. End of text. Second thing, you're getting wrong advice or counsel. They're preaching and teaching a word that goes against the scripture. You all like to go with this feeling, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never leads against the word of God. And I love it, you know. We be bawling, amen, that's right, that's... I yeah, hear, yeah, yeah, you know. But the problem is we don't even have the word in us. So how you know? How you know? We can admit it's a truth, the Holy Spirit over it, but we don't even know the word. So please, please, humbly, be a little bit open that there may be some level of deception in our lives. I am, I'm begging you, but I, I'm encouraging you. <laughs> What's wrong with all you? I'm trying to be nice here. And I, <laughs> I find all this real give me a hard time. Eh? I am seriously trying to appeal to you all. Because a lot of you all sit down. I know we do. You may not see the side of the ministry. Or you might not understand it, but we're very spiritual in what we do here. And some of you, you can see and feel and you can. Hmm. Don't come down from where God have you. But come down from your ego and your pride. Because the word coming forth. And some of you want to pretend like you have it all together. But some of you are really deceived. That's why we don't want the community. We don't want the right voices in us. And around us. Because it will confront the things that we want to hold on to and embrace. As God's word and his work. And it has nothing to do with God. But it feeds your flesh. The last part of the deception was the wrong timing. At any point, going to the temple, not to the holy place, but just going to the temple is good advice. It's good to be in God's house. But it was the wrong timing because they would disobey what God had said to Nehemiah. Wrong source, the wrong advice or counsel that contradicts the word, but also the timing. Is a good way to measure if what someone is saying is from God or from Satan.
You have to understand. The, the scheme of deception came from credible sources. People who represented God. Some of you are still living with lies that have been sowed into your life. Strongholds in your life. Because people you have accepted as people of God spoke the wrong things into you. And you built your faith around those things. Let me tell you something. This journey, on, not, not just with Hope City, even before Hope City, there were lots of things I had to unlearn. I don't con listen, God in his mercy and his grace preserved us to a point in those spaces. There are lots of people I used to follow. And they weren't always off, you know. But when I look at the ministries of how they've gone, I see the commonality of it. And I had to make changes in my life. I had to correct doctrine in my life. I still doing that. We never stop learning. But I wonder if you can accept and receive the word from God. Nehemiah was not just discerning. There was a great deal of courage that came from his call. And here's why. He had the fear of God. Nehemiah did what was right before God. Not what was right for his own cares and concerns. Because he knew he would have to answer to God. Too many cultural Christians in our modern day culture will take their preference rather than conviction. You all will give up what God has called you to if it's not convenient enough. See, that's where the courage comes in from Nehemiah. Because what was under threat was his life. And he said, listen, God didn't change telling me to build, you know. So even if it cost me my life, and it was the amazing thing, we're not even faced with that. And yet we compromise for much less. For what you like. What you prefer. I thought I'll still preach it. And you know why? The enticement still in the world. The enemy don't even have to threaten us with our lives. Because our hearts still so much in the world. That we'll put, even, and you know, it's one thing to say we put in the, the bad things. It's easy for us to look down on people and say, well, look at them. We're them Christians. Look at some of them. They're in fets now. Don't be fast to say that. That is their brokenness. Go and reach them. Love them. Just because your brokenness is not on display. Move that from here. We are not that church. Not everyone walking the same way. But the problem is, your brokenness is after good things. So you put your career before God's call. You put your family before it. See? Yeah, but no, yeah. <laughs> Hit the idols. The church is filled with idol worship. And we don't want to confront that. See, the enemy don't have to threaten us with life yet. Because he already have us locked. That spouse, that relationship. Don't have you locked. You can't follow God this way. And I'm going to say it, eh? Yeah, no perfect people, yes. But we don't want to deceive people. When you hear the word, confront it with the truth. I tell all you, come in as you are, but we don't stay like that. Because the word of God has the power to transform. Has the power to break the strongholds in our lives. Mm. That's why... The things of God's work, His church, His people, is be the first things we cut when we sacrifice it on the altar of our idols. You don't give your time. 
anymore. You don't give your talent. You don't give your treasure. Come on. Because it's easy to market. But you ought to, you ought to, you ought to be able to pull back the layers and watch it. Verse 15 to 19, they finished the wall in 52 days. Here's what's amazing. The enemies heard about it and the very thing they tried to do to Nehemiah and God's people, here's what it says, they lost their confidence. For they realized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Let me say this, everything I say in that might be so hard on it. I am coming in hard like this because it's not about you or I. It's about the glory of God. And if you say, I am a child of Him, I am a disciple of Him, you take His glory and His name to be reverent across this earth. And your life carries that. That's why nothing can come before it. He says, unless you are willing to hate mother and father, Good. Or it thought that was a false teacher there. That in the word. You see how we don't we don't like that one. Unless any relationship bows before him, his will and his way. I know. See, y'all think this is just me just trying to say, well, they're quiet here. We make jokers. Make joke about serious things if you didn't realize. So that hopefully it will disarm your heart in some way but it's not the time and place at this moment in the service the reason you can't wrestle with that is because it has a grip on your heart and it is the spirit of God and all you have to do is to release it into him some of you don't even want to do that it's the hardest part of shepherd I'm lying to tell you all. This is the hardest part of shepherding. Because I want this so much for you. That there's a freedom. And it's not just freedom to say God has done this, you know. For some of you, it's your salvation. Because you are willingly refusing and denying God when you're hearing the word. And you choose not to obey. He said, those who love me will do my commandments. Not agree with them. Not just speak about them. And not one should be lost. Man. Not in this house. But it's your choice. It's your choice. And God is speaking. We reveal the, the schemes of the enemy. But for a lot of you today, what it has revealed is how you are already ensnared by the enemy. Through deception, through enticement, some of you even helping the enemy to pull down your brother's and sister's reputation. You need to ask for forgiveness. You need to repent. The whole Every attack that we hopefully expose today through the word of God. The one thing Nehemiah had that really stood out for every plan of the enemy was discernment. He was able, to, you would look at it and it didn't use the word discernment, but it had the word, I realized or I knew. They did this, but they really meant that. You see the fruit of the discernment. You all with me? But discernment is missing in the church of God. Not because God is not speaking. I'll borrow the words of A.W. Toza. Most Christians don't hear God's voice because we've already decided we aren't going to do what he says. The problem with discernment it's not that God has, has stopped speaking or doesn't speak. His Holy Spirit is there. It says His Holy Spirit will bring us into all truth. And the truth we want to talk about is only theology. No, it's not just to 
understand the word? Is it true to see ourselves the correct way? To see where the enemy has us and to go to God and go to his people when you need the help. But he's all truth and he brings us into all truth and we're wrestling and resisting. We're not hearing God's voice because we've already made up our minds for what we want to do. And part of that is not to obey God. But my prayer today is that when you see the schemes of the enemy, that the first thing that we will do as a church is bow our lives to the cross of Christ. To say our lives no longer belong to us. See, when you receive Jesus Christ, I don't know what kind of prayer you prayed or what explanation was given. But when you said you would follow Jesus and make him your Lord and Savior, it meant your life came under his. Not just for righteousness or holiness, but it came under submission. It came to be, you became a servant of the King of all kings. You can't be talking about grace and you're not respecting his lordship. So the application is just three ways to hopefully help with discernment. Number one, know God's word. Know God's word. Only get these social media rest this week now. I will feel like I waste my time preaching this morning. Don't be posting them. Lizzie wanted me to call names today. I, I ain't doing that. I ain't falling for that trap. Know God's word. Spend time. When you see something and it sounds good, see what the word says first, huh? When they post a scripture and, and expound on it, and it out of context, come now. Just because it's a scripture, don't mean what they interpret from it is the correct thing. Second thing, discernment comes through spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity comes from prayer, fasting, giving, serving, and being part of a community. See, I couldn't touch just one part. For us to be mature in the faith, we have to do the things that the Word actually tells us to do. Be planted. Submit. Confess to one another. Give generously of your time, your treasure. Give of yourself. Give that your time becomes God's first. And he don't get slot into the week when it's convenient or when you have extra. I know that ain't, that ain't popular, but it's still the call of discipleship. Everything I have belongs to God. And I'm saying that as a statement, I'm trying to say that for all of us. Everything we have belongs to God. The life that you live, the breath that you breathe is His. You bore in it right now. And one day, you will answer for that bread. You all know what's scary for me? And why I fight and wrestle to make sure what I say to you here aligns to His word. Because my bread will include giving an account for you. Teachers will be judged more harshly. So don't be quick to desire that. That's what the word says. That's why I'm pleading with you. I'm appealing, I'm encouraging. Sometimes I hit in your heart. Because I want you to wake up from the deception. Final one, the Holy Spirit. You want to get that discernment? You got to live in relationship with the Spirit of God. And you know why I put that one third? Because they have plenty of false spirits out there. That if you don't know the word, if you're not in community, you're not under submission of healthy leadership, you're not giving of yourself, your time, your treasure, your talents, more than likely, the voice you're listening to is either a false spirit or your own. You following a Jesus to your liking, to your design. 
to your acceptance. That's why I put the word first. That's why I put pursue spiritual maturity second. Because it's all those things. Spending time in prayer. Fasting. 21 days we do it together. You should be fasting once a week. Some way, some forms. So I'm not telling you how. But prayer and fasting is a daily devotion to God. Just like His Word. This is what we desire for this church. And all those things don't come down. Whatever God has called you to, wherever He's called you to, don't come down. Some of you need to return, that's fine, but don't come down. Do not leave the things that God has called you to. That's all right. You might slip, you might fall. This might be a message to get you right, to get you thinking right. Don't worry about how he does it. But right now the call is to just be obedient. To say, God, I see where the enemy has made a mock in my life. I've seen where I've made wrong choices. Father, forgive me. But I'm running back to you today. Amen? Here's the thing that I saw. A lot of times when they tell us, in preaching and expositing the word, especially the Old Testament, they always try to compare it to Christ. And the place that Nehemiah strikes me a lot throughout his responses, throughout all these chapters is, I will not come down. When Jesus was on the cross, they came and they ridiculed him. They mocked him and they physically crucified him. But what did they say? If you are the son of God, come down. Save yourself. You saved others. Then save yourself. Christ's only response, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He didn't come down. My Savior made a way for me to be saved because He didn't come down. I can't afford to come down. I can't afford to come down. I'm following Him. Even though it'll be hard. Even though they speak against me. Even though they'll come and threaten and they'll come and there'll be all sorts of things of the enemy are wrong. We will not come down. As a family, we are not coming down. As a church, we are not coming down. We might fall down sometimes. But we hold each other up to pull it back up each other. Come on. Don't do life alone. Get planted. Get plugged in. Amen. Christ did not come down from the cross. And because of that, we now stand as in the righteousness of God, forgiven for all the wrong and evil in our lives. Amen? Because of what Christ has done, we can break the power of deception. We can break the brokenness and find healing and restoration. And even when they insult and talk about our past, we can receive it as truth but bring it to the cross. I did do that. I did mess up. But thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ and the power of the cross. If any man is in Christ, the old has passed away. I am brand new. That's our confidence. That's our strength. That he wants to strengthen this church for. Amen. Every head bow. Let me just pray for you quickly. Heavenly Father. I thank you for your word God. More than just the word of the enemy's schemes. God sometimes it's heavy because. We're in that place. We've been ensnared by the enemy. Father we've acted before we've dealt with the enticement. We've acted even though we were broken. 
even though there are things that you've been calling us to surrender to you we've tried to fix things on our own God we've tried to distract ourselves God we've accepted the deception as truth but I'm grateful God it is your mercy and your love for us oh God that we are sitting here we are connected online that your word is piercing our hearts right now because you love us because you died for us because you didn't just call us to an empty profession oh God but you call us to be transformed in our lives in total surrender to you oh God so father today I pray with this people with our church family in house and our digital disciples oh God that father every life will be surrendered to you once more that God we will come at the cross Father, let your light shine in every area that your word has been trying to touch right now. God, forgive us where we've ignored and resisted your call. We ask for your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, come in. Fill every life this morning. Father, fill every life that you would bring healing, restoration, forgiveness. God, we need a touch from you. We can't do this in our own strength. We don't want to come down, but the enemy has a hold. Father, break free the schemes of the enemy in our lives, God. Break every chain, every stronghold, every lie of the enemy that has been implanted in our lives, every false belief that we have held as truth. Let your light shine, shatter, every spirit of deception oh God we surrender our lives to you today we ask for the deliverance that only Christ can bring only through the power of the Holy Spirit we receive your word your work today oh God in our hearts in our minds in our soul we give it all to you Today. Father, for every life that will call upon your name as Lord and Savior, thank you for not coming down, God. Thank you for going to the cross, even though you were innocent, that we may have our sins forgiven. Remind us of your sacrifice, that all that you call us to does not compare. Strengthen our faith. Renew your spirit in us, God. Renew our minds. Heal us, O oh God, in every area that we have given to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.